Okay, let's talk about cancer. Cancer is a very specific disease. And we've already gone over uh, inherited cancer predisposition. And you have sort of a sense of, um, of how it works. Um, however, what's really required for cancer beyond the germline inherited predisposition, which is, by the way, the rarer case, what's really required for cancer is numerous somatic mutations that deregulate your cellular machinery in just such a way that you will get cell growth and proliferation that eventually becomes a, a tumor. So even in the inherited uh, cancer predispositions, we do need, in the end, uh, somatic mutations to, to accumulate. And um, that's what this segment is going to be all about, cancer genetics and somatic mutations. So um, again, let's remember that for inherited cancers, you have the initial predisposition because you're already missing one of the key genes that keeps uh, cell division down, if you will. Um, and you just need another one to uncover that. Um, in sporadic cases, uh, there is no germline predisposition and uh, all of the cancer cells need to accumulate a new variation de novo as part of their cell divisions. So what is cancer? It's really a disease of cell number. And uh, the cell number becomes large when uh, that disease overrides the homeostatic mechanisms that usually keep a cell uh, in, in, uh, in check and uh, instead you get uh, a whole bunch of cells. Now, how do you get from here to there? Um, again, inherited mutation may predispose, predispose to cancers, so you might have loss of a neg negative regulator of cell division or a mutation rate increase. Um, where that mutation rate increase basically just catalyzes lots and lots of more mutations within every cell division and therefore increases the chance that you get somatic mutations. Um, those are rare because they're selected against. Sporadic cancers are common, um, more common than inherited ones. Uh, because uh, inherited ones are rare because uh, the germline predisposition allele is only one of uh, several hits and uh, if you require 10 hits and the inherited predisposition only gives you one of them then you know somatic uh, mutation still needs to drive the increase in cell number. So lots of mutations and that's the basis for the multi-step model of carcinogenesis. So a mutation happens and you get a cell that's sort of a little bit uh, more proliferative but perhaps cell death still keeps in a check and then more mutations happen etc and so at some point you have the, the sort of the final mutation that takes the brakes off completely and then proliferation begins. So the multi-step model of carcinogenesis. So how does this multi-step model actually happen in cell biology? There are two key components, if you will. Uh, there are the breaks that keep cell division in check. And then there is the accelerator that promotes cell division. And you can either take the brake off <clears throat> or you can put a brick on the accelerator to get cancer, cell growth, and division. Um, and these two uh, uh, examples are uh, really, they're, they're good to keep in mind, uh, the brake and the accelerator. Now, each cell type has a different subset of brakes and in particular accelerators. Um, there are some that are more common across many cell types and many that are highly, highly cell type specific. So again, it's this thing where normal physiology is sort of highly distributed in the sense that there is many tissue specific stuff and then there is some that is sort of more global. Um, and we're going to go over these uh, particular examples. So now how do you think about an accelerator? Um, and uh, there are two terms that are being used. Uh, one is an oncogene, that's the accelerator. So 
um, an activating mutation and an oncogene puts a brick on it. So here's what happens. So you have a signaling protein, that, and this is just one example, um, it binds to a receptor that then sends a signal that says divide. Okay. Um, if the signaling protein is not present, then that's not active. So in normal circumstance, it's off, and uh, here it's on. Now, you can have a mutation in the gene that codes for this receptor that makes it so that the receptor is always on. It doesn't require that other protein signal. Now, this one is always on. So you can do that with a point mutation. And so now you've just put a brick on the accelerator. This thing is now signaling to the nucleus, uh, divide, 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 divide. And then when the cell divides, the daughter cells have that same mutation, of course, and it says divide, divide, divide. And so the daughter cells go on divide. So the point mutation here, this sp specific one, um, of course, you might imagine there aren't that many point mutations that will give you that effect, but all you have to have is one in the right spot. That's one mechanism. The other mechanism is uh, to amplify the locus to make many, many, many copies and basically on mass action activate this receptor. And there's a molecular detail here that explains exactly how that happens, but that's a little bit too detailed. I won't go into that. But effectively, um, oncogenes you can activate by either point mutations or by uh, usually by um, amplification of the locus. So that's the accelerator. Activating mutations turn on growth and division programs all the time. There's no more regulation of growth and division, and the cell and its daughters keep growing and dividing. The other class of cancer gene is a so-called tumor suppressor gene. That is a break. The tumor suppressor is a break. And disabling, a disabling mutation breaks the break. So when you break the break, you can go, right? And that's what happens with tumor suppressors. The functions can be very diverse. For example, P53, the cell death regulator that we've been talking about, is a break because it makes the cell die, right? So that's a break, that's a really serious break on uh, growth and division. And it's a tumor suppressor because uh, when you break it, it releases the, the break. Um, you can have down-regulation of growth signals, um, and you can also have DNA repair. These DNA repair genes are also tumor suppressors, and that's not because of the cell biological mechanism. It's because of a mutational mechanism. They, when you break a DNA repair gene, you make so many new mutations in every cell division that just by chance you get all these other things hit with mutations. So these are the no diverse normal functions, loss of function mutations uh, for these tumor suppressor genes are all the same mechanisms as we discussed before for loss of function mutations. They can be deletions, they can be missense mutations, they can be anything that, that abrogates the function of the protein. Okay, so this is a very important concept. Oncogenes, activating mutations. Tumor suppressors, disabling mutations. So let's talk about the balance between uh, cell growth and cell death. So here's the growth pathway, and here's the death pathway. And here's our transmembrane protein that, in principle, signals uh, to grow and divide. <clears throat> and let's look at how these pathways are normally regulated. Here's our cell death pathway. Um, and p53 happens to be a transcription factor. That's why I'm showing it um, as you know transcription factor that that binds and uh, makes makes transcripts. Um, in principle, uh, there are transcription factors that are uh, oncogenes, and uh, these are not all transcription factors. I'm just using these as examples. Okay, so this is how it normally works. Lots and lots of signals. Remember, this is protein machinery is complex, and there's lots and lots of different proteins that interact in order to give a particular uh, cell biological pathway and to make these signals happen. 
So there are signals that go to the receptor and then the receptor itself signals and each one of these arrows is supposed to be one of the proteins that participates. So um, both processes involve lots and lots of proteins. <clears throat> what you might not have realized until now is that these processes also have uh, breaks. So they have uh, repressors, if you will. So there is a constant balance between the negative signals and the positive signals in both of these pathways. And these correspond to proteins as well. So again, uh, if an activating mutation causes cancer, it's an oncogene. If a disabling mutation causes cancer, it's a tumor suppressor. So in other words, these positive arrow genes in the growth pathway are potentially oncogenes. Turning on these arrows here means that it's a go. So these are potentially oncogenes. These are potentially tumor suppressors because when you break these, the pathway goes. So you get cancer, you get the you get this pathway's contribution to cancer if you activate any of these positive arrows or if you inactivate this negative arrow. Okay? So that's for the growth pathway. For the death pathway, it's exactly the other way around, but the concept is exactly the same. Because the activating arrow here causes cell death, right? That, that's the anti-cancer. When you deactivate these, you have a tumor suppressor. Or if you activate the repression, you have an oncogene. So again, the activating things are oncogene, the uh, disabling uh, mutation genes are tumor suppressors. And the sign is flipped because the phenotype is the opposite effect. Okay. So these four cases are what we need to keep track of. Um, Activating, activating, deactivating, deactivating. In normal homeostasis, um, they interact as follows. You have the growth pathway and the death pathway, and you have the repressor and the, and the, um, and the activator for, for both of them. And of course, again, with respect to cancer, they have opposite effects. That's the whole point here. This will give you cancer, and this will suppress cancer. Okay, in normal homeostasis, uh, the brakes are on. I shouldn't say brakes, the, the, the repressors are on. And there is no signaling because, you know, you don't want cell death. And you also don't want growth under normal circumstances. So let's say that you have a growth signal. It releases the repression here. It activates this, and then the cell can grow. And uh, when it's done its division, uh, the repressor comes back on, the activator goes off, and you're back to normal. That's how it's normally supposed to happen. If you break this, this one may be on considerably, or you have another mutation that also turns it on. So both breaking and this um, might, be, um, might be bad. And now, what happens is that the cell death pathway is activated. Again, we're talking about normal homeostasis. This is the way it's normally supposed to happen. If the cell senses that something is deregulated here, it turns this on, it relieves the repression of the cell death pathway, and it turns that on, and the cell commits suicide. And of course, this, is, uh, this overrides that, right? Because the cell dies. No more division. OK, that's how it is normally. So if the normal homeostasis goes awry, not by mutation, but simply by an error in execution, then the cell death pathway kicks in. So now let's consider what happens in cancer. Uh, again, let's reset to a normal situation. Um, we have the growth pathway, the death pathway, and the various regulatory uh, mechanisms. So how do we get cancer? What you have to have is that this has to be on and this has to be off. That's an and. You, just one of them isn't enough. 
That's got to be on, that's got to be off. Growth pathway on, death pathway off. The genes here um, that govern growth pathway are highly tissue, usually highly tissue specific, and there are many, many, many genes. Uh, remember that tyrosine kinase receptor that I was showing you and the signal that comes in. There are gazillions of those, not gazillions, perhaps a hundred or so different ones. And they all express in different patterns and different cell types, etc. Many genes, highly tissue specific. The death pathway is pretty much mostly just P53, that transcription factor that when activated turns on all kinds of target genes like nucleases and proteases and whatnot that catalyze cell death. And it's repressor MDM2. The repressor function here, that, that's a little more diverse, but basically there is a, there's a well-known repressor called MDM2. So that keeps P53 off. So those are the main players, highly tissue specific genes for the growth pathway and mostly just P53 and its pathway for cell death. So how do we turn this on to get cancer? We break the break and turn on the activator. And how do we turn the death pathway off? We turn off the activator and turn on the break's break, if you will. So now we have inhibited uh, the cell death pathway and activated the growth pathway. Um, these usually have to both happen. You have to usually get rid of the repressor as well as activate something. Here, uh, in the death pathway, it's usually just one or the other. You don't necessarily have to do both. You can either turn on MDM2 really, really high and that represses P53, or you can break P53 and, and then that's it. Okay, so what about the large uh, variety of genes and can give rise to, to cancer. Um, they are found these days um, by an overrepresentation. So in other words, uh, you do whole genome sequencing of the tumors and you ask, do I see mutations in the tumor, in the DNA of the tumor, that are not present in blood DNA? And when I scan multiple individuals, let's say hundreds, do I find that these particular mutations are present in a higher frequency than I would expect? And so there's some rigorous statistical analysis that um, then tells you that these somatic mutations are overrepresented. And you can find them either by whole genome sequencing or by exome sequencing, which is uh, it's sort of more, more uh, limited type of, of genome sequencing. So then you have these overrepresented over uh, genes, many of which might already be known from cellular, uh, cell biological experimentation to be involved in cell cycle or, or other processes. So a driver gene then is an oncogene or a tumor suppressor. Um, if you refer to a driver without saying gene, that usually means a specific mutation or genomic change. So the concept of driver is something that, is, that gets you away a little bit from always having to refer to the more technical, more specific terms of tumor suppressor or oncogene. A driver is simply uh, a genomic change that contributes to tumor development. And a driver gene is either oncogene or tumor suppressor. So somatic mutations um, can be any of the aforementioned uh, genomic changes, point mutations, deletions, insertions, mobile element insertions, rearrangements, etc. Um, and a higher than normal uh, such frequency can or probably will cause cancer. Now the probability of these somatic mutations goes up with the number of ancestral cell divisions. The more cell divisions you have, the higher the chance is that one of those drivers gets hit by a mutation because the number of mutations is proportional to the cell divisions usually. So if you're in a tissue where you have lots of stem cell divisions like in the colon, uh, the more stem cell divisions 
the more, the higher is the likelihood of developing colon cancer, which is part of the reason why colon cancer increases in age, with, with age. And colon ca cancer incidence increases with age because your stem cells have gone through more replications than, than in a young person. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the, other, uh, the other way you can get um, a larger number of cell divisions is if you activate an oncogene so that the cell wants to divide and divides, but the cell death pathway is still intact. And for some reason, um, the cell keeps dividing, but a large fraction of the progeny keeps dying. So what that does is that you've just increased the cell division rate, but you're not increasing the cell number. And that's actually a pretty important concept. So as long as the cell death machinery is intact, you're okay. But you're increasing the number of divisions. And because you're increasing the number of divisions, you're increasing the total number of somatic mutations. And that may give rise to knocking out the cell death genes or you know, further uh, activating mutations that eventually overcome. So that's one way to get um, higher uh, somatic mutation rates. And of course, mutagens, tobacco smoke, the benzoapyrene tobacco smoke, that gives you a higher mutation rate, higher specific point mutation rate. <clears throat> so there are many, there are as many, actually, there are as many uh, cancers as there are cell types. The, you know, all, virtually every cell type uh, can become cancerous, and there are some extremely rare cancers that are really bizarre cell types. And those are, those are tough because they're rare diseases and they probably don't get studied as much as they should. And of course, there are some cell types that are more prone to the, to the brick on the accelerator or breaking of the brake uh, than others. So uh, breast uh, in particular comes to mind, um, and uh, breast, prostate, et cetera, the common cancers, lung cancer come to mind. Generally, there is a distinction between blood tumors and solid tumors. Um, blood tumors appear to require fewer driver hits, and sometimes a single one seems to be enough. Um, and those mutations often happen in stem cells. And in fact, for some more common pediatric uh, blood cancers, they actually happen, the mutations can happen in utero, in the developing embryo. Uh, solid tumors, because the tissue uh, is, you know, there's, there's sort of tissue homeostasis where the cells within a solid tissue are kind of kept in check by, its na by their neighbors and by surveillance mechanisms. Um, solid tumors may comprise uh, many cell types. Um, they have an enormous variety of characteristics, um, and uh, some of them can only convert to a cancer if a very specific gene is mutated. But... Um, some cell types can become cancerous if any, if any large subset of a very large pool of possible genes are mutated, so as in colon cancer, and I will show you examples of that. Um, some cell types only lose p53, so remember that's a cell death gene, uh, and the rest of the drivers of larger changes, massive rearrangements and things like that, but not individual gene uh, uh, mutations. Um, and many cell types require one or two genes to mutate, and then the rest is less specific. So colon adenocarcinoma requires the loss of a particular gene, usually. Uh, liposarcomas require the MDM2 amplification. Um, almost all require p53 loss. So those are sort of the more common ones, but then the other genes that are drivers in the tumor may vary greatly. So let me give you case studies. And I'll start with small mutations, and then I'll talk about larger rearrangements. Uh, I think I have five different cancers that I'm going to just be listing here to give you an impression of, of uh, the diversity. In colorectal carcinoma, 80% of patients have loss of function mutations in a gene called APC. Um, it's also one of the more common inherited predispositions, APC, for colon cancer. And APC is a break on an accelerator pathway. So if you remember in our, um, in our cell growth pathway, 
uh, APC would be one of the negative regulators of the, of the growth pathway. And if you break that negative regulator, you release the growth function. Um, at the same time, 70% of cases of colorectal carcinoma cases have p53 loss of function mutations. And those are just the ones that we are able to detect. The rest of them probably lose p53 in ways they haven't been able to detect because maybe there are deletions that the sequencing uh, doesn't detect or there are statistical issues and whatnot. And this is probably higher than that. In fact, both of them are probably higher than that. So again, um, activate the growth pathway, deactivate the death pathway. And then virtually all colorectal carcinomas also have tens of other genes that are disrupted in about 10 to 20 percent of patients. So one out of five patients will have that gene disrupted. Another set of patients will have another gene disrupted, only like you know, one out of 10 patients, et cetera. So many genes disrupted in a medium subset of patients. And then there's hundreds of other genes that are disrupted in a very, very small uh, fraction of patients. So colorectal carcinoma is characterized by a couple of major, almost necessary drivers, and then a basically a long, long list of uh, genes that are disrupted or activated uh, where any kind of combination might, might contribute to, to the tumor phenotype but it's not so much about the specific gene. And the way you want to think about it is that, of course, it's a complex pathway, and um, there's many ways to impinge upon that, that complex pathway. So colorectal carcinoma is sort of at, on one end of the diversity spectrum, if you will, as far as these contributors goes. Breast carcinoma, 30% of patients have uh, an activating mutation in a, in a uh, protein tyrosine kinase, and uh, that's a growth accelerator. So it, the growth accelerator is activated here. Um, but the funny thing about it is that it's also very often found in non-malignant proliferations. So um, lots and lots of cell divisions might be caused by a, a PIK3CA mutation, but then somehow homeostatic mechanisms kick in and it goes away. Um, in only a subset of those, you would develop cancer. And you see, 30% isn't actually even a very high number. Half of them have p53 loss of function mutations. And a handful of other genes are disrupted or activated in 10 or 20% of genes. And very rarely um, are, uh, are, are, are only about tens of other genes are, are uh, deactivated or activated in. Uh, in a very small number of patients. So if you compare these two, the colorectal, um, whereas lots that are, that are uh, mutated for these and then tens more that are mutated here, uh, this is in fact uh, a much, much lower mutation burden. And it turns out that probably for breast carcinoma, the larger changes that I'll talk about next um, are probably more uh, important. Lung. About 30% of lung patients have a, a KRAS activating mutation. That's a growth regulator. And uh, when it is activated, it turns on the growth pathway. 30% have P53 loss of function. Uh, it's sort of similar to breast cancer in the sense that there aren't that many other genes involved. Prostate. Even fewer people have a particular uh, mutation. And it may be that in prostate cancer, gene fusions of particular uh, oncogenes might be more important. It's not quite as well studied, though. So speaking of gene fusions, let's talk about blood cancers where gene fusions seem to be particularly important. So I'm, I'm giving you two chronic myeloid leukemia. That's caused by a gene fusion between the so-called BCR gene, breakpoint cluster region. In fact, the gene is named after the after the pathology here, after the, the fact that it's, a, it's mutated in, in cancer. BCR with ABLE, that's a tyrosine kinase, that's growth accelerator. And uh, in most cases, it looks as follows. So first of all, the BCR gene looks like this. Has bunch, this is not actually fully accurate, but of course it has a bunch of exons and regulatory regions. Lives on chromosome 22, and the ABLE gene lives on chromosome 9. In your 
blood cell lineages, the ABL gene is off. It's got to be off. Um, and here is the active domain, the kinase. That's what makes that. That's what gives it its function. So what happens in the BCR ABL fusion is that you take the regulatory regions and the first few exons of the BCR gene, and it gets fused to the downstream portions of the ABL gene, always retaining the kinase domain. So this is just one example, of course, a cartoon example, but in all the cases, which are, of course, all independent mutations, right? Every, every child with this has independent mutations. These are not inherited. These are somatic mutations. They all occur independently, every child. But in every case you look, this is the arrangement. You have the regulatory region from BCR, and then the kinase domain from ABL. And so now what, that does, what does that do? This is on in your, uh, in your uh, blood cell lineages. It gets transcribed, translated in frame, and it makes a fusion protein, and the kinase is on, and that cell, that sends a growth signal to the nucleus and the cell and their daughter cells divide, divide, divide. So in a sense, that is, while it's a protein fusion here, the reason it's uh, so bad, the reason it is cancer is because the regulatory region here turns it on in the wrong cell type. Burkitt's lymphoma is similar. So that's a fusion between C-MYC and the immunoglobulin heavy chain locus. Oh, I just, uh, I just went over this. Uh, In-frame fusion, expressed in BCR pattern, protein product has kinase that's now active and sends persistent cell division signals. So uh, similar situation here with Burkitt's lymphoma. We have immunoglobulin cluster on chromosome 8. These are on. These are your antibody genes. They are on in your B cells, in the blood B cells. And C-MYC, which is uh, one of the most best studied transcription factors that is an incredibly potent growth accelerator by virtue of transcribing genes that actually execute growth acceleration because it itself is just a transcription factor. So the effector genes are downstream of it, if you will. It turns them on. So one of the best studied proteins uh, in terms of its effect on cell growth uh, is off in the B cell lineage. But you put them together such that the immunoglobulin locus is fused, um, is rearranged such that the regulatory regions now are in juxtaposition with the CMIC promoter. And now CMIC is expressed in a cell type where it really shouldn't be expressed and leads to proliferation. So rearrangement puts B cell specific regulatory regions upstream of the cell cycle. <coughs> Master regulator CMIC excuse the misspelling. MYC is now highly expressed in B cells and it turns on the perhaps most powerful cell growth and cell cycle program uh, that exists in, in the human genome. So um, those are two examples of blood cancers. So um, let's, so these were, except for the blood cancers, um, the previous ones, the solid tumors, were all small changes. Now let's look at large changes in solid tumors. And there are two types of large changes that we can reliably detect at this point. Um, one is that we have amplifications of 100 kb to several megabases of genes that are growth activators. And one particularly well-known example is HER2. HER2 is one of those protein tyrosine kinases that sits in the membrane. And when, usually, when activated, it sends a signal that says grow. Um, but when it's amplified like this, it sends that signal constitutively all the time. And that's what makes uh, HER2 positive breast cancers particularly aggressive. Uh, they're one of the most uh, difficult cancers to deal with. And so that's a large change uh, where this particular locus is amplified multiple times and it's called a focal amplification. In general, these amplifications are called focal. The other uh, large-scale change are chromosome arm level 
changes. Remember, uh, these are this is a whole chromosome. That's chromosome one, 250 million base pairs. That's some other chromosome. I forget which one. And so, um, in lots of cancers, you have duplications of whole chromosome arms, and uh, potentially also duplications of whole chromosomes. And uh, they are so uh, common in cancers, and it tends to be, depending on the cancer, always particular chromosome arms, that by inference, uh, you can say, yes, these are drivers. Now, they involve the number of, they, they involve thousands of genes, hundreds to thousands of genes, and the genes themselves aren't necessarily mutated, but what they do is they, they give an increased dosage. So now you have not just two copies, one from mom, one from dad, but you have four copies, perhaps three from mom and one from dad, because maybe the mom copy duplicated twice. Okay, so those chromosome arm level changes happen extraordinarily frequently in cancer, and uh, they really just do not happen in normal tissue, uh, or if they do, the cell commits suicide. So it's one of the hallmarks of cancer, really. Um, let me summarize for the four solid tumors that I was mentioning earlier with respect to uh, small changes. Let me summarize what these folks found uh, in their large survey from the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, in colorectal breast, lung, and prostate cancer. Look at the numbers here. So in colorectal cancers, uh, there are 31 arm level changes. Now they're not all present in all the patients, but they are present in many. Subsets are present in many, so any given patient here probably has 10 arm level changes. There are 24 such amplifications and 48 deletions, large deletions, that I'm not cartooning out here, but you can imagine large deletion, you're just losing something, right? Easy. So together, this is a gigantic proportion of the genome in every single patient. Uh, and then you look at the numbers. So breast, high, very comparable numbers, and I doubt that this is a technical artifact. This is just the way it is. That's the way it works. Lung, same. Prostate, same. Um, so really, these very large changes are actually the dominant feature of uh, cancer genomes. It's very hard to figure out exactly what they do and how they impinge on the cell biology to put the brick on the accelerator or take the brake off. Um, they are hard to interpret, but they are clearly very, very important. So just to um, give you a, a sort of a data perspective for a moment, um, and, and also give you a bit of an impression of, of how diverse this really is, um, I'm showing you um, approximately 50 tumor genomes from 50 different patients, breast cancer patients. They are BRCA-positive breast cancer patients. Um, so each row is a patient. Each column here, and it's tough to see the tick marks, but each big column is a chromosome. So this is chromosome 1, this is chromosome 2, this is chromosome 3, 4, etc. Chromosome 22, I've cut off the sex chromosomes. In red are copy number gains, and in blue are deletions. And uh, the redder the red, the more has been gained and the more confident we are of that gain. And the bluer the blue, the more deletion there is. Now, of course, uh, in a diploid organism, you can either have just one deletion or two deletions. So I think in general, what you're seeing is one, one would be light blue and, and two would be dark blue. Um, and so what you see is, again, we have about 50 patients. Each row is a patient you see a preponderance of ARM1Q, chromosome ARM1Q increases in copy number. Almost every patient has that. And I can also tell you that there's some patients for which the data aren't very good, so some of these dropouts are probably just bad data. Anyway, almost every patient has that. Almost every patient has, an, has a chromosome 8 duplication. And then there are many, many deletions, some of which seem to favor places in the genome more than others. So this, for example, 
that's chromosome one, two, three, four, five, six, I suppose. So there's lots of deletions of chromosome six. Not every patient has it. But that's just like the small changes, okay? So clearly loss of chromosome six can contribute, but it doesn't have to. Just like the small changes that are present, only a small fraction of the, of the patients or a medium fraction of the patients. But what you can see, what you can take home from this picture is a stark contrast to the point mutational analysis where there was really only P53 and PIK3CA that were mutated by point mutations, so smaller changes, and then a smattering of others. So in aggregate, those clearly don't contribute all that much to the tumor phenotype than these recurrent changes that occur across the genome. That presents a significant challenge for analysis and treatment of, of tumors, by the way. So that's one example. Another example is this particular sarcoma here, and the representation now is, is very different because it focuses not on copy number variants, not on amplifications and deletions, but it focuses on rearrangements. Um, in a normal genome, uh, this would be completely blank um, because what you have here is an arc when there is this piece of chromosome 17 hooked up to this piece of chromosome 13. Okay, and if you think back to our pediatric de novo patients with chromosome rearrangements, where I had drawn you three chromosomes and there were a couple of interchanged pieces, balanced translocations, in those patients, which of course give very, very severe phenotypes, you would see one, you know, you'd see two or three of these arcs. The, the rearrangements from chromosome 8 to 9, etc. Here you see 500 in this cancer. And so it's, it's um, different from this here. This is just copy number variation where I can't, I can't show you how they are hooked up to one another. But here I'm showing you how they are hooked up to one another. One of the main places that participates is this particular piece of chromosome 12 that contains the MDM2 gene. This is the repressor of p53. So what happens here is that MDM2, um, partly as a result of these changes, is present in very high copy number and therefore highly activated. So that, that really clamps down on cell death. So this activation of MDM2 by these rearrangements and subsequent copy number gains, that's what this is, um, causes cell death to, to be deactivated. But then there's a whole bunch of other things here that happen. And um, it's, uh, you know, tumor genomes are, are really all hell breaks loose. And sometimes we can interpret these as in this case, and uh, these, we don't know what's going on. <clears throat> okay, so let's summarize cancer. In most cancers, multiple genes have to be mutated to overcome barriers to unregulated growth or to inactivate cell death. Those are drivers. And the mutations may range from point mutations to whole chromosome changes. For tumor suppressors, you have to inactivate both copies. Um, and uh, the independence of mutation guarantees that the mutations are different. Uh, one might be a point mutation, the other one might be a chromosome arm loss. For oncogenes, um, they can be activated, they are activated by gain of function mutations, which may occur in only one allele, but they have to be very powerful. So it has to be gene amplification or point mutations that really turn on signaling. Inherited cancers are due to loss of functional alleles of tumor suppressor genes. So they are cell recessive, organism dominant. If pop is hit already, only mom needs to be inactivated or vice versa. So in summary, um, cancer is an incredibly diverse disease. Um, the cells of origin, the tissue of origin, I should say the cell of origin, because it's always just a single cell that starts the tumor, um, is quite tissue specific. And uh, the molecular pathways that uh, drive cancer development um, are partly shared, like p53 and cell death, and partly highly uh, tissue specific. And then even within a particular tumor type, there can be a dramatic variation in exactly what is deregulated 
either via point mutations or via large-scale changes or both. So cancer is a special disease um, because it always starts from one cell um, as opposed to all other diseases which involve you know, organ physiology, if you will. And in that sense, uh, it deserves uh, special treatment and attention um, from a genetic perspective.